G'day everybody, so this is uh, another Q&A, this is the answers of the questions that I was promising to do on Sunday. Um, we were home then and the, um, uh, the uh, uh, 4G come 5G, we tried a couple of phones, was all very weak. I think there were too many people using it and it wouldn't have succeeded, so uh, I said I'd do it on Monday and then yesterday was too busy, so it's Tuesday already and uh, here's the answers, they're a bit late, but anyway, I'll go through them all. So uh, the first one is uh, from Jonathan. How are ocean currents taken and compared to wind, how accurate? So you're referring to the currents on the, um, on the windy map that we use early mornings. Um, there's various ways, I'm not an expert at this, but there's various ways they can determine the current. One is sea surface temperature, because you can see a very different temperature gradient on uh, the currents, because sometimes they're not just on the surface, but they've come up from the bottom. And uh, they're possibly using some uh, optical effect as well by satellite and certainly where there's buoys that are pushing around then uh, that'll give them some indication as well compared to the wind but there's not a lot of buoys out there so i believe it would be to do with the um, color gradients from satellite photos and also sea surface temperature but i'm not an expert and i probably should have looked at this up on google before i got here but uh, uh, that's about as simple as i can explain it to you um, and certainly on some of the east coast uh, currents in Australia and so on it was all of it's based on the sea surface temperature um, you know in terms of determining where the gradients are going and, and uh, uh, speed is quite interesting so it's an uh, interesting question but that's what I believe is the uh, main focus and how accurate uh, it should be pretty accurate because there'll be a really strong contrast between the um, between those gradients and the speed wise is the fascinating one I'm not sure how they work out the speed specifically but uh, you know, so I can't probably answer that to the degree of accuracy you're after. But anyway, that's that's what I know for the for the moment. Um, next one from Vincent, uh, Vincenzo. Uh, what's the scope? Uh, what's the scope of the short stern ladder hoisted from a side of the cockpit up to one meter above the boom? I noted this ladder on several entrant boats. I think what you're referring to is the um, uh, the lattice work for the coax cable for the HF radio. In other words, the high frequency short single sideband radio that they transmit on and talk to each other and listen to weather reports uh, uses the backstay as an aerial so you've got this long wire backstay and it comes down to an insulator because where the aerial is connected to the rigging it can't be metallically connected to any other part of the boat otherwise it's not an aerial anymore and the distance of that aerial uh, is important for the frequencies it receives and so uh, anyway the coax is connected to the bottom of that on the on the on the side, uh, you know, the upwind side of the insulator, at the uh, upwind side of the uh, insulator, yeah. So uh, then that coax goes down into the boat. Now, when you do that, if you run the coax next to the wire backstay, you lose a lot of uh, energy, RF and all the rest of it. So um, it makes the antenna pretty much useless. So you've got to pull it away by a couple of inches. And so to do that, you just use little bits of insulated, just plastic pipe or something like that to hold it off from the wire rigging that was uh, below the insulator and then it goes down to the deck, it goes through a special deck terminal, and then it runs through and plugs into the back of the radio. So it's not actually a ladder, it's actually just standing off the coax from the wire uh, rigging part, which isn't part of the aerial. And the antenna, of course, on an HF radio, if you wanna pick up a good reception on different frequencies, then you have to alter the length of the antenna, and that's done with an automatic antenna tuner unit. But uh, to help that, you should actually pick um, a frequency that's your most common one and use a, a divisible aspect of that so if it's the 10 meter uh, frequencies that you're after you should have a, an aerial that's 10 meters long exactly the same as the frequency or five meters or two and a half meters so if it's long as a multiple of the ideal length for that frequency it helps the automatic antenna tuner unit to to you know get a really good reception and um, the it's like science and art trying to get your radio set up hf radio set up so it performs really well it's got to have a good earth and all that sort of stuff so so that's probably the coax hugo what are the advantages and disadvantages of sloop rig versus catch rig yacht um in the southern ocean a mizzen uh mizzen mast might not be very strong in a knockdown as no four stay or back stay on the other hand is it possible for the mizzen to uh take off the boom and blah blah this is a big subject um, there's some real advantages uh, and there's some disadvantages as well. But the first advantage is if you get rid of your mizzen, your main mast and sails are a long way further forward. So running in the Southern Ocean, um, it's pulling from the front, which is what you want to try and do. You know, it makes it easier to steer the boat. The other thing is that um, if you're then in the tropics or in the Atlantic and you're reaching with the wind on the beam, 
you, with your spread of sales down low, you can actually put what's called a mizzen stay saw. It's like another Genoa in front of the uh, the mizzen mast and get a, a, a huge amount of sail area up there for reaching. And so the boats are quite fast. And sometimes you can see that on, on Goog's boat, on Nuri, when he's uh, blasting along with beam winds, you can really get a move on. Uh, another one is if you lose one mast, if it's not connected to the, the other mast by a wire, called a triadic stay, uh, you might lose one, but you can keep the other, so you can use that as a jury rig. And um, you know, from a cruising perspective, if you're cruising your boat through the Pacific, you've got a few more smaller sails rather than a couple of big sails, so it means it's easier to handle those sails when you're out sailing. You know, you can you have a bit more flexibility. You might want to reef, put one reef in the main, and you know, right, get you know, get ready. You know, I have a staysail and two reefs in your, sorry, one reef in your mizzen, a, a reef or so in your main uh, sail, and then another staysail or something. You can just vary all these different combinations. So. Um, it can be quite good and especially if you lose your wind vane so steering gear for whatever reason you can actually uh, steer the boat using your sails you can balance the sails now a quick explanation of that is if this is the front of the boat and this is the back of the boat and this is your balance point when you're sailing say the winds on the beam if you put more sail area at the front of the boat here it's going to put more pressure on the front and the boat's going to fall down like that okay or if you put more on the back of the boat with your mainsail, it's going to push the back of the boat away and head up into the wind. And so if you want more or less pressure on the back, you just use your main sheet and ease the main out or sheet it in. That's going to put, if you sheet it in hard, it's going to push the back of the boat around and the boat will head up into the wind. If you ease it out and you sheet in on your head sail, it's going to push it this way and the bow will fall away. Or if you, you know, so that's how you can steer the boat with your sails. You know, you can get it perfectly balanced. So, and a catch rig allows you to really play around with that uh, quite a bit. So, the catch has got some advantages. Um, anyway, that's uh, the easiest way I can explain that. Um, so, sailing yacht Hin Muk. Hi, Don team. I have a completely different question. What do the entrants do with their waste, especially plastic waste, and outer packaging in their food rations, etc.? Um, okay, so all of the entrants have to provide us with a waste management plan before they enter the race, okay, before they get their green card. And that waste management plan estimates how much rubbish they believe they've got on board already as they're about to start. So they estimate the number of tins they've got and the amount of plastic on board and, and all the various wastes, except for food waste, because food waste is legal to throw over the side, but everything else gets kept. And they have to tell us their estimate of rubbish, how they're going to store the rubbish, you know, what they're going to use to, to store it once, they, once the rubbish is made, and where they're going to store that rubbish on the boat, okay? And then when they arrive here, we take all that rubbish and we weigh it all, see if it looks similar, and uh, then we'll look at recycling it and, and uh, coming up with some statistics as well. So the only thing they can put over the side is uh, food waste and any biodegradable things like paper or, um, uh, you know, wool if they wool their spinnakers and so on. You might see see some videos of Kirsten wooling her spinnakers with, with knitting wool, effectively, because it's biodegradable. Um, not plastic bands and um, nothing uh, environmentally uh, disastrous. Uh, for Morrison, are you worried with the rate at which uh, competitors are retiring? Uh, no, I'm not worried, but it's it's disappointing in some ways. And there's two types of retiring. One's like Urton that's had a great time and, and sorted out his ambitions for the Golden Globe and understands why he did it and why he wants to retire. Then the other one is, of course, Tapio. You know, his boat sunk. That's like, that's a wow moment. So what the hell? Um, so that was really disappointing in, indeed. Um, and, you know, the, the GGR is, is unique in the world. I don't care what anyone says. There's nothing like the GGR. It's mentally demanding. It's physically challenging and technically quite trif quite difficult. So um, so that that's tough enough. But then over the length of time it is in the boats we've got, which is specifically chosen on purpose to be like it was in 68, it's like a, it's just like this grueling, horrible thing, you know, <laughs> which is really attractive to a lot of sailors because it's special. You've got to use a sextant and so on. And it will always be a race of attrition, you know. Um, in the first Vendée Globe, I think uh, a lot of boats retired. And, and uh, in the first Whitbread races, so many of them lost their masts and retired and blah, blah, blah. It's a learning curve. But, but uh, not really worried, but that's what it is. And certainly disappointed that some of the, the real um, interesting entrants aren't there now. Um, and uh, we've still got a, a great, great race, though, a great adventure, great challenge. So... Uh, yes, it'd be nice to have all 16 of them cross the finish line, but we never expected that, and um, and so it goes. And you know, let's hope there's no more retirements. Um, but you know, it's a long way around the world. Um, okay, from uh, Vincenzo, uh, the Golden Globe Global. So, so uh, 
Okay, so the Golden Globe Basin Globe Society, are they complementary solo sailing around the world? What are the main differences? Well, that's a bit, it's, it's just no other race in the world is comparable to the Golden Globe. And uh, one of the famous sayings of the uh, founder of the race was, oh, the, Golden, the Global Solo Challenge, what it's called, is, is much better than the GGR. So, you know, better ask him, he'll tell you why. Uh, we, we just know that the Golden Globe is uh, a really great race and uh, nothing compares at all. So uh, it's quite different. Uh, how hi Don? How did Elliot's bowsprit break? Well, that's hard to. This is from Tristan. Hard to be too specific on that because uh, there's any a couple of things that could have caused it. There may have been a slight bend in his uh, uh, bobstay. It's a rod bobstay, and uh, you know I noticed that at the start of the race, and it, and it didn't think too much. That could have then straightened out under a lot of load. Um, the other one is it's a tube. Um, um, bowsprit with a uh, you know timber uh, um, what's a platform in between the tubes that, and all of that acts as a bit of compression post um, and because a lot of the force if this is the boat here the bowsprit sticks out like that out the front uh, the loads on it are coming from lifting that way and down to the bobstay so it wants to push the bowsprit back into the boat and for whatever reason the, the end tip just sort of uh, split cracked up so that then had a bent nose you might say which is a bit of a compression break. One side cut all the way through, the other side bent, and uh, it's just the loads there. So, uh, you know, who knows uh, what actually caused it. It could have been in a number of things, but that was the net result. And he's since done a repair and he's sailing um, the best he can, understanding the, the, uh, the strength that the repair has given him to sail with. So that's it. So Ian, is Kirsten's failure to send anything meaningful by way of weekly tweets an issue under GGR rules? Uh, have you been able to check with her whether there may be an equipment issue that is the reason for the absence of tweets? No, in actual fact, all our commu communications are, are based on a specific purpose, and the tweets are to ensure that the, um, the lines of communication are open every day. So we have to get a tweet every day. We don't care what they say, you know. Um, as long as she says she's, she's there, you know, we can see the comms are up, that's good. If she says she's okay, that's even better. Um, and uh, uh, they also have to send a... A, another different type of tweet from their YB3, which is the um, onboard satellite texting and tracking system, the, the one um, like Tapio took into the life raft, just to make sure that's always on uh, 24 hours a day, and that they know how to send a message with that unit, because that's the only way we can contact them uh, if we need to contact them urgently. Uh, the sat phone they turn off after they use it, so, um, so that's straightforward. And as I say, we don't care. When she does a satellite phone call, um, that's a different story again. She's happy to talk and so on and so forth. So uh, she just wants to stay focused. And it was interesting talking to Guy, you know, who's got the barnacle problem that he's going to Cape Town. He said when he's in Cape Town, he hasn't made a decision yet what he'll do, but he was very adamant that he's not going to get into big socialising and start sending out emails and hellos on Facebook and all this sort of stuff because he wants to stay focused until he decides exactly what he's going to do. Now, Kirsten, I've got to tell you, she is loving the GGR, I just know, you know, she's sent me some messages and stuff, it's, it's one of the greatest things she's ever done in her life, and part of that is because she's enjoying the solitude and just doing her own thing, you know, she's running, her, she's racing against herself, she's not racing against anyone else, she doesn't really care, she's just doing the best she can to keep moving, and I can see she doesn't want to break that isolation and concentration and not it's not as if she's busy all day doing stuff it's just the fact that she's on board that's her world that's where she wants to be so it's just to tick the box you know and we don't have any reason uh, to worry about that at all um, okay James so uh, what constitutes solo if you wanted to bring a cat or a small dog would that be allowed <laughs> well we actually discussed this because there was one guy that did want to bring an animal and we haven't had to address the issue at all but it, you know I mean I'm not sure uh, Solo is a, is a is one human being, not yeah one human being on a yacht going for it without any outside help. You know, just a solo person. So I'm not sure um, uh, what else I can say to that. Um, you know, yeah, uh, there was a, a oh anyway, I won't go into it. Um, okay, so Janet, brilliant article, in Yachting Monthly uh, by Katie Strickland. Does Simon seem to have a real knack for reading the weather and comfortable in himself? 
on Clara to decide his way forward through the ocean. Love you, comment. Okay, so the funny one with Katie's, we know Katie really well. She's been following the last race in 2018, this race, amazing lady, great journalist, you know, and she's doing a fantastic job of covering the GGR. It's really good. And she's one of the journalists that's twigged to the idea that there's a huge amount of material here and it's not hard to get. Um, you know, all the stuff that we put out, you know, just even the SoundCloud, you can pick up great stories off that and, and uh, people are interested. So good on you, Katie. Uh, anyway, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, Simon's article particularly, and she's ringing entrance uh, regularly to, to put our own stuff up. Um, the funny one was that Simon quoted me saying, oh, you're just getting good luck, Simon. That's why he's so far ahead. That was out of context. So I said at some stage that, yeah, he's doing all this and he will, he's getting a bit of good luck because you need luck no matter what happens. But one thing's for sure, Simon has a very good understanding of, of many things. He's a top racing sailor. He came second in the Mini Transat some time ago, which is incredibly competitive, and other sailing races. You know, he's done a lot of sailing. He's got a well-prepared boat. He's got really good sails, right? So the sails are high-performance sails matching his skill to trim those sails. And when it comes to weather, he's paid attention to the whole thing. He understands weather, and he's really slipped into the south, the Southern Ocean mode. He hasn't spent time down there before, but he's obviously studied a lot, and he's got it already, I can tell. He understands what's going on. And he, he will tell you himself, it doesn't really matter about the weather forecasting when you're in the Southern Ocean, because you know it's a set format of highs and lows, you know, low pressures coming along one after the other, northwesterly, swing southwesterly, all this sort of stuff. He can see the barometer's rising or falling, depending on whether he's going in and out of the, the center of that system. And uh, and he sort of knows what to expect. So he's really comfortable with what goes on down there. And once you've twigged to that, uh, you do get a bit comfortable because you just know what's going to happen, whether you've got a forecast or not. It's like the square riggers that went through there. All the clipper ships, they never had forecasts. They just worked the weather. They knew what was going to happen. They went on with it. And it's something that I, I get off on a bit um, and it, because it's something that entrants sometimes don't grasp about the Southern Ocean. Um, it's very um, it, it's very unique place, the Southern Ocean, and it's very... Uh, good when you do get to the point you can understand it and I have no doubt that Simon is right onto it so he's pretty comfortable uh, Andrew why is, the, is there a no go zone well that's the big orange zones on the tracker map uh, the main the t two reasons um, we work with the rescue coordination centres in uh, various all around the world and down south they wanted us to not go too far south because it makes it very hard if not impossible to get to some parts if you're a long way out so that was part of it. And the other one is that we're mindful of um, weather down there. You know, the further south you go, the more demanding it gets. And uh, uh, so it's, it's just a common sense rule. This year, the weather is all the highs, the low pressure system is down low. A few people have suggested, well, shouldn't we just drop the no-go zone? But, but it's, it's not the way we work. You know, it's not just us. It's, it's thinking of other people as well. And it's very similar um, as to the Vendée Globe, which is the opposite end of the scale. Super fast, super big boats all that sort of stuff and uh, they do the same thing it's it's, it's just common sense so uh, okay the uh, uh, Bernhard uh, thanks for the for this option sorry if the question was already answered in another info does the sailor know where they are in relation to the others no not unless they've been given some information but quite often and usually they don't really know unless they're talking on the radio to each other and then they'll find out and can they communicate with their loved ones only by radio um, and and when they're in the checkpoints, okay, but but yeah, the, the, that's part of the challenge. It's it's isolated. You can only use your HF single sideband radio to make long distance calls. The satellite phone is only used for safety and talking to uh, race control us uh, for logistics reasons. So uh, yeah, they're on their own, and some of them uh, miss that dearly, and some of them just miss the idea of communicating with people and chatting about things and all that sort of stuff. So. So that's a, a big part of the uh, a big part of the challenge. So, and at checkpoints, uh, they don't have a normal phone to use. But if the family are here, they can. And if the, their friends are there when they come through, they can't touch them. They can't get close to the boat, more closer than one meter. But they can talk and chat and listen to bits. Bless you, Jen. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, that's it. Okay, next one, uh, Alistair. Hi right, Don, what's the most popular reefing system being used? Single line, two line, or more traditional methods of placing a cringle over a hook on the base of the mast? Do you have a preferred method? Uh, basically, uh, pretty much everyone for the mainsail is using slab reefing, and I think it's fair to say that pretty much everyone is using a leech line and a luff line to pull the, pull the sail down. 
so even if they're uh, using it from the cockpit, where they're all the lines going to the mast, down to the base of the mast and back to the back to the cockpit, you can reef the mainsail very easily without leaving the cockpit. Those that are some, you know, quite a few of the entrants are leaving all of those lines at the mast for simplicity. So it means they've got to put their wet weather gear on and gear up, and then get out there, go to the front of the mast, and uh, then do it manually. If they're at the mast, they may not have a, a luff line because they're able to ease the halyard off, pull the the luff down, put it on the hooks, the horns on the gooseneck there you're referring to, put the cringle in the hook, and then crank the the uh, the halyard up, get the luff tight, and when they've done that, they can then uh, pull up on the uh, leech line, which is uh, usually at the base of the mar- uh, base of the boom. You, know, you just pull that up and then you've got your slab reef in. Uh, personally, I'm a great believer of uh, full mainsail control from the cockpit because it saves a lot of energy, time, and uh, it's a bit safer in my mind, especially for old blokes like me. Um, if you're reefing the main and you don't have to go up there, it, it's great. But even when I did the BOC in, in, when I was 35, you know, uh, I had everything back to the back to the cockpit because you could come up and you didn't have to gear up with all your gear and you could get there and you could drop a brief in really quickly. I could use my furlers to to uh, get the genoa in and things like that. It's just simple. And plenty of people have uh, had injuries going forward to the mast at different times. And uh, uh, you know, I'm just a great believer of uh, reefing gears uh, for for those little advantages. Okay, uh, sunny, sunny. Given the current conditions of the Southern Ocean, would it be worth reconsidering the prohibited boundary? Oh, that's what we were referring to before, dropping it down because the, there might not be consistent westerly flow. Uh, no, because we're thinking about the rescue coordination centres as well. And, uh, you know, it's still sailing up there. It doesn't matter. You know, if you look at where Matessia was, he was right up in 35. And uh, you look at where Jean-Luc was when he went through in 2018, he was, he was right at 40. And our zone, this one's down at 44. So there's still plenty of scope, and, and even now, actually, it's looking pretty good for the next few days, so uh, not too bad. Uh, Liam, the race rules coverage set has evolved since 2018. What do you think will change in 2026 from what you have learned to date? Comms, routes, stops, equipment, etc. Loving the adventure. Uh, nothing will change, uh, except for one thing, which we're about to announce shortly. So, uh, uh, no, we think it's a pretty good mix, you know. We, we did quite well in the 2018 race. Everyone assumed that the sailors would sail over the horizon and no one would ever hear from them again, so it's no use getting involved with the race. It was quite the contrary. You know, we, we, we put the tweets out, we do the SoundCloud recordings, we do the live uh, coverages when they come into the film drops, and we do other, you know, lots of other different things to keep uh, up with what's happening and get that story out to the people. Yes, we don't have satellite photos and we don't have satellite videos, but who cares? You know, we've got a great story going and those that are interested can feel it with all those things. You know, the tweets are amazing if you follow that. You know, if you get it on Twitter or see the summary on Facebook, um, it's a really good thing to see. So so we know that mix works and we're not going to play with it. It's perfect in our mind. Uh, and uh, there'll be one little change coming up shortly, which we'll announce uh, in the next few days. But, um, but 26 will be pretty much a uh, repeat, but with completely different group of entrants and boats and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, so it's uh, still a whole new story. Everyone will be different. Uh, John. Uh, Hi, Don. Many of the skippers don't, didn't take traditional routes south to 40 in the Atlantic and hooking up into Cape Town. Why was this? Do you feel this was because of the different weather patterns for this season? Or do you think the skippers would have been uh, further ahead if they had followed the traditional route? Thanks. Well, I think there's two things there. Well, there's a few things there. It's really hard to predict. Everyone's free to do whatever they want. When they get around Trinidad, they can go wherever they want. But uh, in hindsight, looking at what happened, I think a few, quite a few of the entrants would have been better off getting further south faster. Um, but that's easy to say after, after the fact, you know. Um, for me, if I had been out there, I would have been influenced by where I believe the other entrants were and what weather information I have on when to turn left. There's no doubt if you turn left too late, you're losing ground. If someone turns early and get it, gets away with it, like Damien did, um, he turned pretty much as soon as he got around around uh, Trinidad. He picked up nearly two days on Simon by doing that because Simon was sort of forced to go further south by the weather at the time and then he got to turn left. Um, so you can see it's quite, quite critical, that whole turn. And I remember when I made mine in the BOC, uh, I did reasonably well, but I think I went at least 24 hours too far south before I turned and I was trying to get all sorts of weather. And, so it's a big decision, but that's yacht racing, you know. And uh, But generally, yes, I would say a few of them, if they're not getting weather 
and didn't know where the other entrants were and and uh, just had to get to Cape Town, yes, I'm quite certain that a few of them should have been further south. You know, it's it, everyone. That's that's what you're supposed to do. It's like a highway down there. Um, but anyway, in hindsight, it's very easy to say that. Uh, okay, Chris Brown for 26. It says the mast section type is free. Does that mean you can have a carbon spar? Does it need to be the same weight as the original mast, or does the rig need to be the same weight? So carbon mast and heavy wire would all be allowed. No, it would. The uh, carbon's completely banned, and that's explained in the notice of race. Uh, but when we say the section is free, we didn't want to control the dimensions of the section. We've left that up to the entrant and up to their yacht, their riggers and stuff, to decide how strong the section should be. If someone's a big fat one deck stepped or keel stepped or skinny one you know doing whatever then it's entirely up to them and uh, we we trust in that because no one wants to lose their rig the same with wire size we we uh, used to restrict the wire size minimums to the same as the original design back in 2018 and that didn't work because jean Luc had a problem with his mast and they wanted to fit thinner lowers so there's a bit of stretch we said no it's always been eight mil you have to have at least eight mil and he believes that caused one of the problems of the rig. So as soon as that, we reviewed everything. He said, right, yeah, everyone that can design their own. But the height and lengths of things has to be as per the design. So but carbon is particularly banned in the uh, banned items. So uh, uh, Jules, Jules C, um, we used to stay in Hobart long enough to greet all the sailors this time. Will Jane be there? Many skippers look forward to seeing her. Seems like she brings comfort. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, yes, we will be there for all of the skippers that are going to make the gate. Uh, we arrive in Hobart on the 17th and we leave on the 31st. So we may not be there for anyone who doesn't make the gate. Um, but if that's the case, we'll have someone there filming for us and uh, doing a live when they get in. And then they'll have to stop and stay there until December next year uh, uh, before they can take off again. Uh, and Jane will absolutely be there, but Ada may not. <laughs> so uh, it's an interesting story. She's uh, got a lot of things happening and blah, blah, blah. So it's hard to pick the, the uh, timeline there. Uh, can, next one, Gillian. Uh, can you explain the orange boxes coming up from Antarctica on the map, please? It's a no-go zone. Those orange boxes, if any boat goes crosses the line and gets in the box, they, um, they will actually get a three-hour time penalty for every hour they're in the box. So they have to be very careful. And uh, we don't accept if they're running right along the top of the box like this, doo -doo -doo -doo, and there's a big blow from the north comes and blows them in, that's their problem. Um, if, uh, if we believe they haven't left enough of a buffer, and, and a lot of them are sailing way too close to the line if a big storm comes and blows them down. At the same time, if a big storm comes and uh, we need to give them a weather alert for safety reasons, uh, to a degree, we may route them down through into the box and then uh, decide what happens without penalty. Uh, but we take into consideration how they set themselves up before that storm as well. You know, we might say, you can go in the box, we're going to give you a two-hour penalty anyway because you were so close to it, you had no option, you know, whatever. So it's a bit arbitrary, but it's, any decisions like that are made in the spirit of the GGR, and uh, uh, we haven't had to do that yet, so let's hope we don't have to. Um, Okay, Steve, following on point from Johan Stratum on boat types, I see potential for two fleets. Something along the line, say Olympic class, Corinthian class, da 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 Olympic, blah, blah, blah. forget it, it'll never happen. There's only ever going to be one class. So uh, we don't want to play with the um, play with the formula. The formula works. And, uh, you know, the GGR is already getting a reputation of being an amazing challenge. It's not for everyone, but it's like it's like one of those things that becomes a classic, you know, where where uh, it's it's just really tough you know you can describe it in so many you know different ways but there's nothing like it and this is like the ultimate test of human endurance and and it's getting renowned for that and known for that and the boat types is part of that challenge you know and it, and it also means everyone's got a chance of winning because you've got you know you've got a biscay 36 up the front you've got a, got a cape george 36 chasing your tail really hard and fast by kirsten you've got a rustler 36 back there as well you've got an oe 32 you've got all this different stuff and uh, uh it makes for a great race so we don't need to play around with it we thought about a joshua class at one stage but but that got knocked on the head as well it wasn't um proven to be correct um were uh, from margaret were there bowsprit issues in 2018 no there weren't and there were only a few little bowsprits, but no failures or any issues at all. Uh, Johan, I would like to understand your brilliant concept for the race better. Why restrict the choice of boats to popular 20-plus production boats? Uh, 
Well, the, the first one is the production boats because there's a lot of them and anything built before 1988, they were built really strongly and there's plenty around at reasonable prices that can be refitted and prepared to sail around the world. Um, and fiberglass is a known entity. You know, most people can tell what, what's good and bad fiberglass. We didn't want to get into one-off steel and aluminium and timber boats and all that stuff just because we didn't have to. We can use these production boats. We know that people are going to have to buy their boats for this race, but that's fine. They're all similar. You know, it's easy to understand. And so why uh, any boat that do... Uh, any boat that do well should be easy to sell and probably put into production. Why only GGR hulls? Hulls. Well, you know, that's I just explained. You know, the GG, the G, 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 you know, glass hulls are, um, you know, just easy to understand. There's a lot of them, and they last forever. You know, I, I just bought a new boat, which you'll hear about later on, and it's fiberglass, and it's forty, uh, what is it, seventy-seven, whatever number of years. It's really old, but I've got to tell you, it's like brand new. You know, it's, it's like forty something years old. So uh, that's cool, and you can recycle them. It's just part of the circular economy, you know. Call it what you like. Sustainability, all those things, and it, it really makes sense. So, um, so that's that's part of the reason. And the reason the boats are similar is to give everyone a fighting chance to win, you know. And I think what you'll find now, you probably won't get anyone that'll rock up. And in fact, they can't now, you know, in the same boat that uh, our Nord's got because it's just not fast enough. And I think some people now realise that they've got to be fast enough to get through the gate. If you can't do that. So that may stop people getting smaller, slower boats. But what's slow? You know, slow might be the weather, slow might be equipment, and so it goes on. It's the formula of the GGR. It's tough. There's, you know, you're always going to get a lot of boats dropping out and stuff like that. But, but we uh, we like that concept. Uh, okay, uh, Geo. Thanks again for doing these sessions, Don and the team. Which skippers besides Tapio arrange private weather skids? We know. Uh, so much else we know so much else about each skipper's boat prep etc but it would be good to also be able to look at the different uh, results through the lens of weather info planning thanks i don't really know because uh, how many entrants have done their own weather planning because it's not up to us to know um, we they work to their own rules of uh, what's in the notice of race and then they make their own plans but what i do know is that uh, tapio had some uh, uh, private skeds set up. Uh, Abolish is uh, uh, looking like trying to do skeds now. You know his team are trying to do some sort of connection. Uh, and uh, who else? I think Goog had some things going there for a while with some boats. Uh, Kirsten's managed to make some connections. I don't know whether it was pre-arranged or whether it's come up because one South African guy doing a great job. In fact, he just I forget his name now. He just relayed the. Uh, relayed their uh, mandatory HF coded message. We, we require the entrance every two weeks to send us a coded message that gives us all the information of their position, their course, their speed, uh, how they're feeling, how the boat looks, all this sort of stuff in a series of numbers and letters. Okay, And they've got to do that using their radio, either the VHF radio or the HF radio, so that if at any time the satellite comms disappear for some reason, someone blows up the satellites or they run out of electricity or, or whatever, They've, they've been practicing the ability to give us critical information by radio, which is kind of cool. And we, there's a, a guy, he's a ham radio operator that's using marine frequencies as well in Cape Town that took the, takes the call from, from uh, Jeremy, who got then the relay from Kirsten and also Abolish and passed it in. So all three of them did their mandatory thing through a, a, a private maritime net as well and things like that. So. Uh, so I couldn't tell you the whole list because I don't know. Some of the others may have done stuff, may not have. Um, okay, and uh, next one. Uh, oh, we've just done that, yeah. Uh, Marcus, with regards to the start, month and year, do you have to work these around other races and their organisers such as the Vendee, Vendee Globe, the Route de Rum? No, not at all. They work their races around us. We're much bigger, so uh, it's not a problem. Uh, not really, joke. Uh, no, not at all. We, um, oh, to a degree, you know, when we came to the start here in La Sable de Lone, you know, the, the original plan, yes, we were going back a couple of months and I wanted to start on August the 22nd because it was significant for the start date of Bonobo here in Joshua in the 1968 race when he started from Plymouth. And uh, we got together with, uh, with uh, the mayor here and uh, discussed it. And it was actually a lot more, uh, uh, a much greater benefit to start on September the 4th than August the 22nd. It's only a few days, uh, but it was summer and all that sort of stuff. And there's, it's, La Sable goes from 60,000 people to 240,000 people or something in summer. It's quite a place. It's a great place. 
and so uh, you know everything would have been fallen. Uh, there's a lot of activities here anyway, and so by delaying it, so that was the first week is summer holiday, the second week is is open. It makes some things more achievable, more interesting. Extends the summer here for the Saab de Lone, for people for things to do. So, uh, but we didn't even consider other events um, at all. So, Mike Phillips, uh, Don, just a quickie. What tools would you take to cope with any barnacles should the problem arise? Oh, good old, good old fashioned Auss Aussie Barbie scraper. You know, it's like a big plastic handle. You can get two hands on and go boom, boom. But if you're um, if you're uh, in the water trying to do it you've got to have flippers because you need to put pressure on you to go forward otherwise when you push on the hull to push the barnacles away you're just going to push off uh but goose barnacles are really horrible you've got no idea they're they're rubbery and flexible and and stuff and then they've got this really hard calcified base and you can forget the rubber but when you go with the scraper the, it, it just goes along and chafes and you can't get to the base the scalpel at, at the bottom so you need something really sharp and i'm not an expert in this but uh, just see the pictures that we've all had it's just a horrible thing to do and once they get to a certain size it's really hard so i you know listen to what the entrance is sailing i've never had to do anything like what they're trying to do over the side in the water and go through it i've done plenty of over the side and cleaning off dirty bottoms of hulls and i know what it's like you know it's, it's hard even in the water in calm water and stuff so so it, it's pretty horrific but you need something very sharp uh, you know just like a normal scraper but the best thing is you get something you can get a couple of hands on you know so you can really get into it but as I say I'm not an expert you know, I'm just using uh, my impressions on that talk to Guy he'll tell you when he's done it and we'll see the pictures of what his boat's like when it comes up and we'll we'll make sure we get some vision of what they're going through to get it off the bottom and then you have to imagine trying to do that when you're uh, trying to swim in the water hold your breath and all those sorts of things which is really tough uh, okay John uh, uh, how do you monitor the skipper's radio comms to make sure they aren't getting weather routing or position info? Uh, when they meet up with an unaffiliated ship, are they allowed weather routing and position from that ship? Okay, first question. Uh, we don't actively pursue it. We don't have radios on here listening because we wouldn't hear it anyway. But I've got to say, it's a small world and there's a lot of people out there following the race. And I'm reasonably confident anyone uh, doing radio skeds would, that they thought was uh, not quite right. Uh, we'd get a we'd get a nod on that. So hey, have you seen this or you heard that? That's exactly what happened in 2018. We've already had uh, uh, a couple of entrants uh, give us information that they were a bit confused about, which we later subsequently clarified. They'd been hearing some things, and uh, you know, there's people more and more people are understanding the rules of the GGR and what they can and can't do. So so you know, maybe they could get away with it. Maybe they wouldn't. You know, but uh, that's the GGR. You know, if someone wants to cheat, they they've got a good chance of getting away from it but why would you you know why would you go to the the the, the challenge of the ggr and then try and play games with yourself and live with it you know it's a, a interesting uh, situation marcus can you synchronize weather reports and position reports uh, now there now there can be one to three hours difference in boat positions and weather well you know i mean we could uh, the weather uh, comes the, well, yeah, I can see what you're getting at, but the weather uh, updates and the way we slide it along, oh no, that's not quite right either. So first of all, we get four hourly positions, okay? And so if the weather's been updated in a, you know, in one hour or, or 10 hours, you know, you're not gonna get any different than that. We could change the forecast uh, tracking times, okay? Not the weather, but we could bring it from four hours to one hour if we want, but it's just too hard to try and synchronize that. And it costs money as well every time you, ping a position you pay uh, and so you, you just got to use the best balance and you know four hourly is about right and no one's really after totally accuracy on that to, to work out um, you know exactly the line it's an overview of what goes on oh it was great talking to Ian and uh, Ian uh, Herbert Jones today on the weather forecast that we're giving him versus the storm that he had and all that stuff we knew it was hard but you want to have a listen to that and you'll see that the forecasting isn't quite right the, the storms and the wind isn't quite right as the computer model shows you you know um, it's an overview impression so uh okay did i answer there was that oh sorry there was a question i know question two i didn't answer it uh when this goes back to john when entrant meets up with an unaffiliated ship are they allowed weather routing and position info from the ship sorry i forgot to answer that yes they can get anything they want from a ship at sea and that's always been the case for the last couple hundred years you know ships at sea when they meet if someone wants weather or whatever they give them everything so if an entrant got to the bridge of the ship say hey can you get online uh, and he says yes oh quick get onto windy ty or windy 
uh, the site and, and tell me what the weather's doing now. And he could give detailed explanations over the radio on Windy. And if the guy happened to be a sailor, the officer of the bridge happened to be a sailor, and he looked at it, said, look, my suggestion is that in the 24 hours you want to be at this position, latitude and longitude, and then 24, uh, 36 hours you should be there, 72 hours you should be there. That's my impression what you should do in the next uh, couple of days. It's completely legal, and that's weather routing. But that's allowed because it's a ship at sea, and it's an unassociated ship. It wasn't a rendezvous or anything like that. They can get whatever they want from there, and they can also do a telephone patch to their family uh, using the radio onto the ship, satellite phone from the ship to the, to the family, and talk to the family, do whatever. That, that's part of course. So... Uh, uh, okay, so uh, Margaret, keel step mast versus deck step mast in the GGR. It's a it's a formula for that. If you've got, if this is the mast and you want to keel step it, so it's going through the deck down to the keel. You can see it's supported at deck level there, and then it's got spreaders and stuff. So a mast this thick is just fine because you get a lot of support by having it it's supported over that level there. If you want to step now the mast on the deck and just sit it there, you see. It's, it's got no support there. So this thin one would probably be no good because it's going to go and it break. So if you're going to step it on the deck level, you need a fat one like that, okay? So there's no real advantage or disadvantage because uh, you just change the size of the section. But if you, if you had uh, this small section and stepped it on deck, that's a big problem because it's too thin, you see? So you can vary it. But if you have now a fat one like that, which you're going to have deck stepped, which is going to do a great job. If you decide just to extend it another couple of metres and still have the fat one down here, like that, supported there and there, wow, it's really increasing the potential strength and column uh, rigidity uh, below the first spreaders quite a lot. And that's what some people do. You know, they'll, they'll go with a keel step mast but use the fatter section, which for a little bit of extra weight for that one, which is down low, it's not going to affect the performance too much, will actually greatly increase the column uh, strength of the, the section and, and increase the strength of the mast. So there's a balancing act on, on that one. No easy answer. But uh, in some ways, some people like to have a deck step mast because if it's ever going to break or you're going to lose it, it's going to go clean at the deck, right? If you have one that's down below, it's going to snap off somewhere. And it, and on a not-so-strong boat, you can damage the deck, and which is all sorts of other problems. But uh, I think it's up to the up to the skipper. You know, would I have deck step or keel step? I would probably have keel stepped for the uh, GGR. Um, okay, did Elliot ever eat his fish? I don't know. I didn't ask him. <laughs> I think he's due to. When's he? I forget when he's due to call in. Jane, Jane, remind me to ask him if he ate that big fish. Um, okay, uh, Graham. Uh, what were the anti fouling regimes of the competitors which produced such different results? Uh, uh, I read about Jean Luc's uh, thorough regime in the last GGR. Did not the others learn from this? Well, obviously not because. They, they didn't follow it exactly, and so some of them got barnacle problems. But you know, there's more to it than that. And generally, uh, you know, I mean, everyone, all the entrants had different ways of tackling, tackling it, did different things. But I think there's another unknown entity here, and that I think everyone now concludes that the the area of the tiny baby barnacles that are floating around, okay, happens to be somewhere between the um, somewhere between the Cape Verdes and and uh, the uh, equator somewhere through there that's where they all jumped on because the entrance leaving leaving Cape Verdes and, and Lanzarote you know the Canaries and stuff they didn't have any at all and then all of a sudden through there they all jumped on and I think it's not a constant band going around the world like that I think there's a cloud of the baby barnacles there and there's a cloud there and if a boat happened to go through that cloud bingo you've got barnacles the same here but if there's none in the middle and the boat goes through here I think they might not get the same level of attachment and, and contamination. And I think that's a big factor because uh, even though some didn't learn from what John Luke had, some just put normal stuff on and went straight through and had virtually bugger all. So I think there's a lot of different factors there involved. Uh, but it's pretty clear that some things aren't working. Um, and uh, if what would I do if I was doing the GGR? Why reinvent the wheel? I would have absolutely copied everything that Jean-Luc did and hoped that I didn't go through one of those clouds of barnacles. <laughs> so um, anyway, and I read about Jean-Luc's uh, regime. Uh, my one circumnavigation started in the Caribbean where TBT is allowed, so I had no problems. Same with a lot of boats, TBT. But we, uh, I haven't got them here, but we don't talk about it a lot, but I will later on. Uh, we've taken samples of every, uh, every anti-fouling on board the boat except for copper coat. On all of the boats, we've got them here, and we can be they can be analysed any time uh, for TBT. And if we find TBT in the 
or tin in the antifouling, big problem for the entrant. But uh, anyway, we've got all those samples here and uh, we keep them on file. Okay, Deborah, even though Kirsten received compensation for having to rescue Tapio, would she not have also been in a better ocean weather system as Simon has been? Uh, taking nothing away from Simon, who was a fantastic sailor, but the ocean globe seems to be in his favour. Uh, the ocean gods seem to be in his favour. Not a sailor, as you can tell, but so love watching the GGR. Glad you love watching it, Deborah. No, well, when we worked out the compensation for, um, for Kirsten and Abolish, we actually take into consideration the weather they had the moment they left the race to start heading north to assist Tapio. And then we looked closely at where they were uh, geographically and that they had they needed to get back to a certain position to be back in the similar sort of weather and we also oh. looked at the weather they were then going to have for the next couple of days going forward and we based the compensation that some people think was a bit too generous on that very fact you know that that, that you don't want to be missing out on the weather so uh, I'm very comfortable with the compensation she's got uh, it's a time thing it's it's uh, 35 hours and so that doesn't that can work both ways as well. 35 hours on the course can be at one knot or 35 hours could be at seven knots, but it's only added at the end of the end of the race, so uh, end of the adventure. So, you know, it, it's fair and reasonable. And, and what I'd say for Simon is uh, often when you're in the lead, you will get weather breaks. You know, that's part of the course, you know. Winners are grinners, you know. You, you get out there and you that's part of the advantage of being in the lead. You know, you can grab onto weather and go. And uh, Simon's... Uh, uh, had his share of good luck but you know it could be said so is Kirsten at times she's had areas of bad luck but that's sailing and uh, I'm sure between now and the finish Simon will have some areas of bad luck and so on but he's he's doing pretty well and so is Kirsten so uh, uh, yeah um, okay so we're just about done I think uh, last one Ted uh, how are the races collecting water to refill their supply uh, all from rain of course and uh, different people do it different ways uh, I, th I think two thirds of the fleet or more have got a dedicated system. You know, the best one I saw was um, was uh, Damien. He they they stitched a garden hose sort of thing into some cloth uh, on the edge of the mainsail. So if you can imagine this, it's like they created. If there's the mainsail here, the, the the sail cloth, they created this sort of cloth with with sort of strands at the top, but it's fully stitched to the bottom. Which, which became a gutter. It was like a gutter, it was fantastic. So the whole of the mainsail could be here and then all the water would run down the face of the mainsail, get picked up by this gutter that's there all the time, it's permanently stitched in the sail, runs along to the end because it was angling down and then they put a hose fitting and then just put garden hose and where you go. I thought that was pretty cool. I used to use a, a bit of sailcloth at the foot of the main, a sailcloth, because it could be a loose footed main, imagine that, then stitch sail, uh, spinnaker cloth on and have a big, spare bit there you know so it's loose like a like a, a gutter connected or just connected to the boom and then uh, what you do is you lower the mainsail just a bit about that much and as you lower it it makes the gutter and then I put a skin fitting on that normal half inch plastic through hull skin fitting and I'd stick a hose on the back of that and you could fill the tanks really fast some are just using buckets on the end of the boom and on the gooseneck and like Sir Robin did in, in uh, 68 so anyway crikey so that was another long one uh, thanks for watching these question and answers and we'll do another one this weekend and hopefully there'll be less questions and, uh, uh, and I can get it up as quick as I, quicker than I did this weekend. Thanks for that and I've got to press the button now. Uh, got to press the button. <laughs>